I would like to personally welcome you to Faith and Hope for Today. We are here to bring you the clear word of God to strengthen your faith in the challenging time we live. We know that your faith produces hope and that God will take you through anything. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember you are near. The pace of life just gets so out of hand. I'm reminded of how much I need to know You are for me Well, it's really great to be in your home again with you today, and we are going to continue our second part of our series on Matthew 25. And today we're going to have some review, and it'll be on the story of the talents that were given out, and I'll review that in just a moment. But I want to take you to our photograph. This is one of those moments on the Pacific Coast, one of those jetties that stick out and you can see the beautiful trees and in the foreground right below it is a little yellow boat what maybe if you got close to your screen to the bottom right the bottom third happens to be a red kayak over there with someone oftentimes these are fishermen or just tourists or often uh, abalone fishermen thank you sherry for just taking us to the ocean for a few moments in one of these beautiful scenes i hope you enjoy sherry's pictures i certainly do so we have an important conversation with you today. Its title is called The Final Appeal by the Three Investors. So in Matthew 25, let me just review the story briefly. The master calls his three servants. He gives one one talent. He gives another one four talents. He gives another one five. And then he is going to challenge them to invest all of those talents and when he returns which he says is going to be after a long a very long time that he will audit the books he will examine the books he will investigate to see what was the benefit returned by his servants so you know uh, as we go through the review I'm going to show you the value of those talents, but, but I also want you to understand this. The parable of the talents is not about money. The talents are symbolic of something far more important. The value of the talents reveal the precious value of the master's possessions that he gives personally to be invested. In the story, I want you to understand the value of the wealth that you and I have access to this very precious wealth. Its purpose is to set in the context between the ten wedding planners in which only five were successful and the story of the sheep and the goats in which only the sheep reap the benefit and the reward. And in between those two parables are the talents. So we must also pay attention to the importance of the audit or the investigation of the returns that are made by the investors. So, the math master leaves his wealth in the hands of the three to invest. It reads like this. To one he gave five talents, to another two, I, I said four earlier, I should have said two, that was the audit, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Now, I've already implied that these talents are to the members of the church, but we're each given to our own ability. Did you notice that? And then Jesus made his ascension, and this is a parable to the elect for those who remain until the master returns. And that means that would be for you and for me and all of our friends. 
The story continues, now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. You know, the audit is an investigation that reveals the return on the investment. There is to be an investigation or an audit by Christ. He comes and returns as the master, and the audit reveals what we have done with the precious things that belong to the master that he's gifted to us personally. I would say as a church, as individuals in the church. So this becomes then a very important parable for you and me as we live closer to the end of time. So now after a long time he returns, here's the audit. Here's what the audit is going to reveal. If the 63 pounds of a talent was silver, one talent would have been worth $22,428. Four talents, about 89000 but the 10 talents would be worth a quarter million dollars. Now, if it was a talent of gold, and the parable doesn't say it is or isn't, but what I want you to notice that today, at one talent of gold is worth about $1.8 million. But if you went from two to four talents, you're returning $7.2 million. And if you took the five and you get 10 talents in a return, you know, that would be $18 million in the audit. But what if those dollars represent people responding to the gospel? What if he's re referring to those talents as the precious value of every person who by faith says yes to Jesus? And that that audit reveals those who are going when he returns, take back into eternity with him. So that audit reveals our return with the master's precious values. Valuables, I should say. Now, in the parable, any investment gives a return. Any investment. What I'm trying to say to you is that it is impossible to lose any money on investing the master's possessions. And if that possessions is, is people, then any investment you make by putting the treasures of Christ out into humanity, it always brings a return. The one who buried his portion did not get a return, and he was cast out. Now, what does that mean for you and me? It means that we are simply free to invest. There's going to be an audit and investigation into what was invested or not invested. In other words, if you just accept the truth of Jesus into your life and do absolutely nothing, when the audit is done, it reveals that you kept it all to yourself. And it would make you just as selfish as the goats in the judgment story. What I'm trying to say to you is you take anything that you have received from Christ and you invest it in this world anywhere. You are guaranteed a return. And you do not want to be one of those who experiences the consequence of never sharing the truths that are so precious in Christ. You don't want to be that person in this parable. It isn't a good thing. Who are these three? I'm going to argue they are the members of the church. They're you and me. We are the recipients of the treasures. We are free to invest. There will be an audit, an investigation into what was invested or not. That is reality that Jesus is leaving as a message you share anything of the master, it never returns to him void or empty. In the parable, if you invest, it is a guaranteed return in some manner. And maybe you and I never see the return of all of those investments. In the story, any investment brought a return. I don't know how many times I want to say that. But the more I say it, the more I hope you understand. 
the only consequence in the investigation would be to not invest. You see, the final audit reveals what and who has invested the master's treasures. The review is over. Let's get now into the important of those treasures. Let's talk about the Christian life. And I want to pose two questions for you to ponder. First, what is important to God? In the parable, what is important to him? That he is willing to give you what is precious to him? As precious as gold or silver or maybe more? What does God want us to know about the judgment? That there will be a return on your investment. Did you catch that in the parable? I hope that changes and paints a more beautiful picture of the judgment for you. That in the whole of your life, just sharing God's love, kindness, caring for others, reaching out and helping another human being is guaranteed a return to God in the story of the talents. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to help the early Christians have a deeper and greater understanding of their new life. Now I shared this with you when we covered the parable the first time, but let me read it to you again. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of of this mystery among the Gentiles. Did you catch the word, the riches of the glory of this mystery? The immense value and wealth? Paul defines it as Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is one of the richest things in the kingdom of God you could possibly encounter. It's an amazing thing that has unlimited value and wealth. Now let me go on to Colossians 1.28. Paul writes to the church at Colossians, or Coloss, we proclaim him, admonishing every person and teaching everyone with all wisdom. That's investment language. Why? And then he continues, so that we may present each one complete in Christ. And I'm going to state, to be complete is to be ready for the judgment. Because in Christ, you are made complete. In Christ, you have the riches of this mystery, Christ in you, to spread to the entire world in your whole Christian life, guaranteeing a return. I wish that every member of every single Christian church could embrace this simple truth that if we corporately as religious bodies irregardless of the name over the door of the church were to invest the grace and kindness of Christ in this world there would be a phenomenal return that would be exciting wouldn't it Romans 1 16 and 17 I want to develop this further for you Paul writes I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is, now notice the value here, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel puts God's power in your heart and in your hand as a believer to the Jew first and also to the Gentile or to the Greek, as it reads in the text, the Greek was what they called Gentiles in that time. Verse 17, for in it, that is the gospel, that's in your possession, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to greater faith. That's what faith to faith means. That there's no end to the growth of faith. As it is written, quoting Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Did you know that the gospel is fully proclaimed in the Old Testament? That the righteous man shall live by faith? 
is from an Old Testament prophet? Living by faith is not a New Testament gospel. It is the gospel that emerged from the Garden of Eden. And it heralds till the end of time. Verses 21 and 22, Romans 3. The righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's the first five books of the Old Testament and all of the prophets in the Old Testament. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. What is Paul saying? That the righteousness has been manifested in the Old Testament scriptures. Don't let somebody tell you the Old Testament is irrelevant today, when in fact Paul's entire argument of the gospel emerges from the Old Testament, the books of the law, and the prophets, because they were proclaiming righteousness by faith in the Old Testament. And here Paul is arguing that very thing in Romans chapter 3, 21 and 22. Now notice verse 23. Paul makes a statement. And I want to say before I read this to you, listen carefully, that every one of us is human beings. No matter what country you live in, no matter what church you go to or do not go to, we share a common reality as brothers and sisters of the human race. Listen carefully. Verse 23, for all humanity, I'm adding the word humanity, for all humanity, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, I've met a few Christians who will tell you they haven't sinned. But you can usually tell by how they say that, that they're actually sinning, but that's another story. Notice verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace, how are you justified? How are you declared innocent in the presence of God? How are you acquitted as all those who have sinned and fall short? How are you acquitted? As a gift by his grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Isn't that profoundly simple? Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. And we're going to do a word study of propitiation in our next presentation next week. You do not want to miss that. That is such a remarkable and wonderful word. I could read it this way. Whom God displayed publicly as a restoration with God in his blood through faith. Verse 25. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration. And then Paul argues, I say of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier. That's the one who acquits you. The one who restores you. The one who reconciles you to the Father, the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And what is faith in Jesus? It is the courage to say, yes, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart and into my life. Faith is always an affirmative response to God. It is always an affirmative response to Christ. A yes, if you would, is always an act of faith. Would that make saying no to God then putting you into the dimension of sin again? By saying, no, I really don't want anything to do with you. Think about that for a few minutes. Let's move on to verse 27. Where then is the bragging? Where is the boasting? It's excluded. You can't brag about this. By what kind of law? Of, of works? Of duty? No. No but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man or woman or child is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not 
the God of the Gentiles also? And then Paul argues, yes, of all the Gentiles also. So listen carefully. If you're saying yes to God as an act of faith, every yes to God is an act of obedience. If God says love your neighbor as yourself and you say yes and you accept God's love to give it away freely to invest it in others, you are in harmony with the law of God at the same time you are living under the law of faith, an affirmative response. Verse 30. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Do we nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. And that's what I was just saying to you. Every affirmative response to God is an act of obedience to God. Hence, establishing the law of love to God and love to your neighbor, which is described in detail as the Ten Commandments, God's holy law. Love to God, the first four. Love to humanity, your neighbor, to other human beings, the last six. Isn't that just beautiful? It is such a profound and exciting truth. Now notice verse 4 in Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sin or transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In other words, we get to live by faith as if we're seated with Christ on his throne in the heavenly realm. We have access 24-7. Did you catch that? So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. That is not an angry God. That's a loving and gracious God, isn't it? For by grace you have been saved through faith, that's your yes to God, and that not of yourselves, your yes is I will receive the gift of God freely. Through faith, and that is not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so no one may brag about it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so we would walk in them. Living by faith puts you in harmony with what God has already prepared for you, and that is to invest the precious treasure of Christ in you, the riches of that glory in another human being. Do you know the works God has already prepared? That is for you to invest that rich treasure of Christ in you, the hope of glory, with another human being. So the brief overview of the gospel shows it is a priceless treasure as demonstrated by the talent's actual value. Because you see, we're gifted this treasure by Christ to invest by acts of faith in this world so that people may receive this precious gift and also invest it. We now live under the gift of the new covenant. And I'm just going to take a moment and walk you through that. It's in Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. A covenant is a will that you get as an inheritance. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 33. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws within them and on their heart. I will write it. I will be their God and they shall be my people. By faith, accepting Christ into your life, brings you in harmony with the law written on your heart. So every act of love to God is a response to what God wrote in the new covenant. Every response to another human being is what God has written on your heart to define that you are truly his person. 
Hebrews 9.15 reads it this way. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. I've added a new will. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, that's the cross, there have been called, I'm sorry, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. We are living under the new covenant for a will that gives us an eternal inheritance, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is part of the great wealth of Jesus, your eternal life, gifted to you. I have just one challenge for you. Please, do not refuse the gift. Look, the Holy Spirit is at work in this world. But what is the Holy Spirit's job? It is to reveal to us the truth of God's grace, of his mercy, to reveal to us the riches of the gift of Christ who has reconciled you back to a whole relationship with the Father. And I'm going to argue this. If a person will simply not refuse it, and what do I mean by that? Please do not present the gospel as choose it today or, or you're lost. Present the gospel so that it remains open-ended that a person may grow into that acceptance. Because if a person continues throughout their life to remain open, they will be led, as one author has put it, to the foot of the cross. Please, present this gospel not as a take it now or die, presented as an open-ended conversation for you and your friends. That they may remain open to the continued wooing and directing of the Holy Spirit. Well, we're coming down to the end of our time. And in these last few minutes, I, I just want to show you this really beautiful rhododendron. There we go, I got that out, thank goodness. That Sherry just happened. And if you, if you live over on the west side of the Cascades, more coastal, and in some places on the west, depending on uh, where the climate is. But those rhododendrons are just so, you know those bushes, this one is like 10 feet tall and just covered with those lovely flowers. Think about how God made something so beautiful just to put your mind at ease and, and just admire and go, is that not extraordinary? I hope you're blessed. We have more conversations coming. Keep an open heart. Keep an open mind. Be available to the Holy Spirit. Thank you for watching today. Our email address is screamingrockministries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho, 83303.